A lot of times when I'm making videos, I do focus a lot on the cons, the setbacks, the drawbacks, the things that are an, in, that are an inconvenience or a frustration. And it can be very easy to look at that and think I'm just complaining or I'm whining or oh, just another person on the internet sharing their opinion. And that is true. That's what we're all doing here. We're all sharing our opinion. But when you're weighing the pros and cons of something, I do think the cons are far more interesting. This isn't to say that just because there's a lot of cons associated with a particular camera or a particular system or device that it's overall, it's bad. It's just things to be aware of. Usually the pros, the good things about a device are front and center in all the marketing. You know, the, the product page will tell you everything great about the camera. It's gonna tell you that it's got 8K. It's gonna tell you that it does RAW or 10-bit 422 or 120 frames a second or whatever the latest and greatest is in the specs. They tell you all the good stuff up front. What's more interesting is the stuff that is not all that great or that is annoying or an inconvenience that can hold you back. Because the last thing you wanna do is buy something based on how amazing it's supposedly gonna be and then realize, oh, the actual reason I bought this, it doesn't actually apply. This is why I criticize Canon and the R5 and the R6 for the overheating, because that is something that you would not expect. They're not gonna put that front and center on the product page saying our camera overheats. They're gonna tell you all the great things it does, and then it's up to the person on the back end to realize, oh, I actually can't use this the way I want, which is likely the case with both of those cameras, although there is some interesting stuff going on right now of it maybe is the cards that are in the camera that are getting too hot. And if you take the cards out, then you can do certain things. If you have an external recorder, that seems like kind of an annoying workaround that maybe isn't quite right, but we'll see how that unfolds. In any case, the A7S you know, Mark III, a lot of people will say how great it is. Is this 4K, you know, 4K 120, 10 bit 422. It's got all the great features, the flip screen, the image stabilization, the autofocus, everything's fantastic about this camera. And yet you still have to acknowledge that 12 megapixels may not be enough for some people on the photography side. Does it mean the camera is awful and it's trash and it's not worth buying? No, of course not. It's just saying, pay, you know, pay attention to this one thing that may be a limitation in certain situations. We all shoot a little bit different. We all have different types of projects. So just understanding that. And it, while it might be obvious to some people, it's like, oh, of course it says it's 12 megapixels. It's like, no, understand the ramifications of that. That actually might be a good thing in some cases, but it also may be a bad thing in others, depending on what you're trying to do. And just having a healthy conversation, understanding around all these things is really valuable. And it usually revolves around the cons, what they are and how to address them. Are there workarounds? Are there things to know? This is the case with Magic Lantern or when the GH1 and the GH2 were hacked. The hack brought such amazing potential to these cameras. They just really unleashed all of their true horsepower on the 5D Mark II and the 5D Mark III, the GH1 and the GH2, really unleashing their full potential. However, with the con that not quite as stable, maybe not as reliable, hey, the file sizes are a little bit bigger, actually a lot of bit bigger, a little bit harder to work with, terms of the Magic Lantern side of things. And oh, by the way, just make sure you don't do X, Y, and Z or things can break or be really hard to fix. So understanding all that isn't to say, oh, you should never do it. It's just to know all those cautionary warning things up front so you don't make a mistake and get yourself into a situation that then you regret later or you end up losing out on a job because you look bad in front of the client. There are so many things that can go wrong on any project and preparing for all of those worst case scenarios really is our job to know what could go wrong and then how to fix it. So knowing all the limitations of a camera, of a lens, of a whatever is very, very helpful in terms of problem solving when these things do pop up. If you decide to go with the Canon R5 or R6 and you say, yeah, I don't, I don't care that it overheats. Well, you say that because you're thinking of the workaround and how you would address that. Maybe you would use an external recorder. Maybe you would switch to a different mode. Maybe the modes that overheat, you don't even need. And so you completely say, no, I, and, or maybe you don't even do video and you just want the photo side. Absolutely. But pointing out the cons for the people who it does matter is important. It is valuable to talk about those things, to really know how everything weighs out in the final balance. This applies to any camera, every camera, there is no perfect system, although there are some that get pretty close, even with the GH5. For as much as I love the GH5, 
there are still some limitations and things you can't do that you can do with other cameras. If low light is really important to you, the GH5 maybe isn't the model for you. Maybe you need the GH5S or you need the A7S. Knowing the limitations helps make better, more informed decisions. And it's not just hating to hate or complaining to complain or making a, a headline to get clicks. It's about letting people know what they really ought to consider. And maybe those people who are listening say, I, that none of that matters to me. And that's valuable too. So you at least recognize it and you can say, yeah, I, I feel great about my pre-order or getting that camera when it finally comes out, whatever the case may be. So just something to keep in mind, at least from my personal perspective, when I'm talking about pros and cons, it's not saying I love the camera because it's, it's pros and you know you have to buy it. If you don't buy it, you know, you're an idiot. And same thing on the con side, saying it's not saying I hate a camera or that if you do buy it, you're an idiot. It's just saying, understand these things, can you weigh it in the balance? And all of that just comes from my own personal perspective and how I see these cameras based on how I shoot and the projects I've had and the experience I've had working the way I work. It's just one person in the grand scheme of things sharing their opinion and weighing the pros and cons from my perspective. And I don't even know all of them, you know? There's a lot of other people out there as well who for them, maybe what I think is a con is a pro for them, right? If it's the 12 megapixel thing on the A7S III, maybe some people, they want, you know, that smaller megapixel count. Maybe there's other people who that's a severe limitation. It's different in every situation. And that's why it's, it's good to have these conversations and talk about this stuff so that I think that's far more interesting to understand why someone might see it as a pro or a con. And then that can help inform your own opinion about the camera. Maybe it makes your opinion stronger or weaker, or you can consider a camera maybe you hadn't heard of before, like the Zcam E2 F6 or some of the stuff from Blackmagic or even the Lumix S1H, which isn't the most popular full frame mirrorless camera by any stretch of the imagination. It's kind of the underdog in a lot of ways or the S1 or the S1R, you know, these are not cameras that are held up in the same way some others are. So just understanding all of them, what their limitations are, is really, really valuable just for your own knowledge, for the community to talk about these things. And it's not just haters gonna hate. That's an easy way to excuse it away and excuse criticism. Criticism is valuable because it makes things get better. When you look at the A7S III, Sony listened to the criticism. It is obvious in their design of the A7S III that all the criticism that was thrown at the A7S and the A7S II has been addressed. That criticism makes for a stronger product. And it's not to say the A7S and the A7S II were bad. They were great cameras. But talking about the cons, the things that set them back, helps make for a stronger, better product in the A7S III. And that should always be the case. Things should get better. Nothing is immune from criticism. It is how things improve in the long run. And that's why I do personally like talking about it because again, I think it's far more interesting than just talking about, hey, here's everything they're already telling you and let's just all get excited for this camera. No, let's understand the problems, the legitimate problems that could come up and then how you would address them or why certain things might be right for certain jobs. It's all just good understanding in the long run.